ladies and gentlemen. Let's try that again. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our third and final lesson on the unit on Chinese government and the dynasty system. Our final lesson is going to focus on what happened during the Mongol conquest and the Ming dynasty. So that is our essential question for the day. Uh, and the Mongol conquest uh, is particularly interesting, particularly if you've heard the stories of Genghis Khan. We're skipping the vocabulary today. We're going to go straight into it. And our first question is, what was rule by the Mongols like? So to make a long story short here, folks, China was conquered by an outside power. Uh, what we now know today as Mongolia which is actually a very poor country today. But uh, in the year 1276 in the Common Era, the Mongols overran the imperial capital of China. So if you've ever heard of Genghis Khan, um, probably one of the most successful um, people of all time in terms of being a conqueror and conquering uh, massive territory. Um, and uh, his, his uh, his relative, Kublai Khan, um, got to take over China. So if you look over here and you notice what they call these khanates, um, those were uh, areas that were ruled by different members of the Khan family. So uh, after the capital was overrun, three years later the last of the Song emperors fled and China was essentially ruled by foreigners. They were ruled by the Mongols from what we now know as Mongolia. This might be a good time for me to pull up a map and show you where Mongolia is today because it's its own country sandwiched between Russia and China. So Kublai Khan uh, took the title Emperor of China and he declared the Yuan Dynasty. And this dynasty lasted for over a hundred years uh, it was not a native Chinese dynasty, it was a dynasty of conquerors, um, but it was in fact a dynasty and is referred to as such. Um, Chinese society was divided into four classes under the Khan dynasty, uh, and the native Chinese did not much like these classes, and you are about to see why. At the top were the Mongols themselves, so the foreigners who conquered China uh, gained the status of the most important people in China at that time. Right underneath that were foreigners who were not Chinese, who were brought in by the Mongols and were friends of the Mongols um, to rule over China. And these were people from Europe. I mean, the Mongols conquered a wide, wide area. So people from the Islamic world were brought in, people from India were brought in, people from parts of Europe were brought in. Um, and this was very uncomfortable for the native Han Chinese. Um, third in this class system were the northern Chinese, um, and they were in this class because they were neighbors of Mongolia. Mongolia is on China's northern border, so basically the Chinese that the Mongols were most familiar with uh, had a higher status. And the worst status was the southern Chinese, those in the south of China, because that part of China was far from Mongolia. So you can see where, if you were Chinese, this system was not particularly appealing to you. Uh, the Mongols ended the civil service exam system, but they didn't have enough people to run the country themselves. Anytime you're a foreigner and you go in and you try and take over someone else's country, uh, you need people to help you do it. And if you don't have enough people, you end up with a problem. And so then they made that problem worse or they exacerbated that problem by bringing in people from outside, foreigners, to help them rule. You know, most people don't like it when foreigners come in and actually like try and take over their country. They're more than happy to let people from outside the country come in, but uh, to be taken over by foreigners is an entirely different story altogether, and the Chinese are a very proud people, and this was very uncomfortable for them. Uh, in fact, it was so uncomfortable that eventually they rose up and rebelled, and in 1368, the Mongols were finally forced out. 
usually if you are a foreign conquering power, time catches up with you and it is very difficult to maintain that control over a long period of time when the native population doesn't want you there. And that's what happened to the Mongols. They were finally kicked out and their leadership became corrupt. Um, they lost their motivation and eventually the Chinese were able to take their country back, which brought on the very next dynasty, the Ming Dynasty. And why was the Ming Dynasty important? That's our new left side question. The first answer to that is they simply restored Chinese control over China. That was kind of a big deal. Uh, this is the geographic area that the Ming controlled. So uh, most of what is today the eastern two-thirds of China. Uh, there's still this western third out here that uh, is part of China today that was not part of the Ming Empire. And there is a photo from the Ming era. Uh, the Ming Dynasty restored native Chinese rule after the Mongols were defeated. So for that reason alone, the Ming Dynasty was important because it restored that Chinese sense of nationalism and pride in themselves in running their own country. And they restored the civil service examination system, so they brought some order back to the system and they put people in charge who at least proved they had some right to be in charge. And that system lasted uh, into the 20th century until the, the People's Republic of China and the Communist takeover in 1949. We'll talk about that on an enrichment day. Uh, the thing is, the civil service examination did not focus on some things. It was mostly focused on the things we talked about in the previous lesson. Um, poetry, reading, Confucianism, the four books, and such forth. But it didn't focus on science. It didn't focus on math. It didn't focus on engineering. These are kind of important things that someone running the government might want to know something about, but that was not emphasized. Um, it also didn't focus on commerce, business, and trade, making money. They, those were considered the lowest levels of uh, human endeavor and were not emphasized and were not considered important. And so government bureaucrats really didn't have a lot of knowledge about them and didn't have a lot of respect for them. And yet that's how the rest of the world worked. So because the Ming were not able to adapt to changing times in a world that was based on science, math, engineering, commerce, business, and trade, um, they collapsed. They were not able to keep up with um, the rest of the world, which is uh, very historically ironic because for most of world history, the Chinese were by far the most advanced, the most dynamic, and the most um, mature of world civilizations, but at the time the Chinese were starting to go down, uh, the Europeans were starting to rise out of what were literally called the Dark Ages. Um, and we'll talk about that later this semester. So irony can be pretty ironic sometimes. So because the Ming Dynasty collapsed, um, it fell into a weak period again, and it became vulnerable to both invasion and strong influence by foreign powers. Uh, if you're not strong enough to stand on your own two feet, you are then uh, weak enough to be influenced and controlled by others. Uh, and that is true for countries, and that is true for people. And that is a lesson that should be learned. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the third and final part on our series of lessons on Chinese government and the dynasty system. Now would be a brilliant, a wonderful, and a fantastic time to write your summary. Uh, and you can either write that summary on the two dynasties we've discussed today, or you could write a lengthier summary on this entire unit of study on Chinese government. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Blumendahl signing off until our next lesson in 7th grade social studies. Be well.